So, Dr. Carlos Marias has traveled all the way from the great country of Miami. So, thank you very much um, <laughs> to talk with us about uh, potential alternatives to preventing transmission of mitochondrial DNA diseases, uh, particularly heteroplasmy shift therapy. Okay, I do have some slides. All right, so I've been cutting slides because <laughs> the time seems to be short. And uh, I'll be talking about the specific project. So, I just want to mention that's funded by NIH, UMDF, and, and MDA. And uh, how do I change the slides? I ask for it. Okay. <laughs> this has been uh, alluded several times, but I think for people, particularly the non scientists, it's important to remember that when you have a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA in humans, most often they are mixed with the normal mitochondrial DNA. It's a condition that's called heteroplasmy. And uh, in the vast majority of human patients, that's, that's what you have. And as the cells start to divide, as uh, Dr. Shubri was mentioning, you can have distributions uh, in one direction or the other. The next. And this family exemplifies well how important this distribution is. For example, this is a, a gel that can differentiate the mutant and the wild type mitochondrial DNA. You don't need to know the details of the method, but the upper band is the mutant, the lower is the wild type. And you see here that uh, only this uh, member of the maternal lineage is affected. It has uh, muscle uh, myopathy and diabetes, and here we analyze m a muscle biopsy, uh, white blood cells and hair roots, and you see that, that there's a lot of mutation here, but the other maternal relatives also have quite a bit of mutation, but they have relatively lower levels than this patient. So if you change this heteroplasmy a little bit, you might uh, correct a lot of the problems, biochemical or clinical. Next, please. So for many years, people in the field has been thinking how can we target the mutant or mutated and, and not the wild type. And uh, one way is to find some way to uh, cut this specifically. And there are a class of enzymes that cut DNA very specifically. And those are enzymes that are used in molecular biology called the restriction endonuclease. They're bacteria enzymes that can recognize small sequences that are very specific and cleave. And we start trying that approach. So the next slide. So the idea is to take a gene that codes for this restriction in the nuclease, that's the fancy name for this enzyme that cuts DNA, and put a sequence that uh, once this protein is made, the sequence is like a zip code that sends it to the mitochondria. So now we have an animation. Can you click once, please? So then this protein would go into the mitochondria because of this targeting sequence. One more would uh, bind, let's say, to the mutant mitochondrial DNA, one more. Once it cleaves, this DNA gets degraded. And then you have a reduction in the number of copies of mitochondrial DNA. Now, the mitochondria tends to keep a normal copy number. There is a mechanism controlling that. So one more click. So whatever is left is going to replicate, and you have, uh, again, more mitochondrial DNA. Since you got rid specifically of one type that supposedly was bad, now you have more of the good one. So that, that's the overall approach. Next. And we test that actually uh, with uh, a mouse model that was developed by Dr. Eric Shubridge that has two types of mitochondrial DNA. They do not cause disease, but they have sequences that are a little different. One is called bulb, and the other type is called New Zealand black. And uh, we test that in cells and in mice, as we'll show you. But the idea is that these this cells from this mouse has these two types of mitochondrial DNA. And we found an enzyme, a restriction enzyme, that could cut the bulb type mitochondrial DNA only once. But it did not cut the New Zealand black type of mitochondrial DNA. So this enzyme is called APL1, and we put a target mitochondrial targeting sequence here, and that uh, we express in these cells, and we expect that it will cleave some of this blue mitochondrial DNA so you have more red. The next one. And uh, we did lots of experiments in cells and in mice. Here, for example, uh, we put this, uh, this gene coding for this protein in, in, uh, in a virus. Uh, by the way, this is the work of uh, Sandra Bachman and Sean Williams in the lab. And injecting these mice, and all the muscles here receive this virus. Once you inject once, it goes to the muscle. And just, just showing the different muscles express this enzyme, that's this, this green band. Uh, next slide. And uh, what we found, one more click, please, is that if you compare the mice before injection and after injection, those are different muscle types. You see that here you have a lot of the bulb mitochondrial DNA, 
but then this enzyme cuts the bulb. So now, uh, after the injection and uh, six weeks later, you have the mitochondrial DNA being mostly the NZB type. So it's exactly what we expected, and we had already shown that in culture. So that works very nice. Unfortunately, these restriction enzymes recognize uh, sequences that are quite small. So usually, mutations that cause disease will not create you know, a site that's perfect for these enzymes. Next slide. But this was alluded recently that a new class of enzymes have been discovered recently, and they're used to edit DNA. Like uh, CRISPR that was mentioned several times, but there are others like zinc finger nucleases or, or talin. And we have been working with talin. We did work with CRISPR, but uh, it doesn't work as well for this, and I don't have time to discuss here why. But the next slide, please. So talins are, are proteins. Uh, the bind to DNA, and they have repeats. And uh, there are two amino acids here in every one of these repeats that depending which combination of two amino acids will bind to a different base in the DNA, A, C, G, or T. So by, by playing with these repeats and putting the right combination, you can make this protein bind to any sequence you want. So basically you have a, a protein that binds a DNA, a specific sequence of the DNA. Uh, next. That's how it binds the DNA. Next. Now, it doesn't cleave the DNA, but uh, you know, smart uh, molecular biologists attached another piece of protein to this protein that binds the DNA. That's uh, an, an enzyme that cleaves DNA. It's called FOC1, and it, it needs to, you need two of those. You need a dimer to cleave the DNA. So you need two hybrids here that have the protein, uh, the DNA binding domain and this cleavage domain. So we need two monomers. Next. Now we tried for different mutations in culture cells, and this is just one example with a point mutation that causes uh, 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 optic neuropathies, a blindness, and also dystonia. And I think uh, Dr. Wallace described this originally. Next slide. So what's the approach here? You remember I just mentioned that we need two monomers to cut, so we need one that will bind to a DNA that's present in the wild type and the mutant, but then you have the other monomer that we have to de design the talin binding domain that can bind only the mutation, the region of the mutation, not the wild type, to make it specific. Next, uh, two little clicks, or one, one little click maybe. No, two, one more, all right. To make a long story short, uh, what we call yellow here are cells that got the Stalin, and the black are the ones that did not. Did not. And you see here that we analyze the DNA with the point mutation or the wild type. When we express these enzymes, uh, we get more of the wild type and, and, and less of the point mutation. And here it shows that you know the, the, there's a decrease uh, in the total levels immedi immediately after the treatment, but then later on the levels of mitochondrial DNA come back because of this copy number control. So I do not work with the reproduction. Uh, you know, our goal is to treat mitochondrial diseases. But we have been collaborating uh, with a group at the Salk Institute. Uh, the PI is Juan Carlos Espizua Belmonte. And uh, he has used this approach, both the restriction of nucleases using that mouse model, and, uh, and, and also the talents to try to change uh, all sites and uh, one cell embryos changing the heteroplasmy of the, of the mitochondrial DNA. This work is in press, so it's under embargo. I cannot talk about it, but that's an area that uh, it could be uh, an alternative approach for people that might have some objections of, of borrowing DNA. Uh, next slide. Here I'm just showing that the activity of the mitochondrial enzyme gets better, but this is expected. We know that if you have less mutations, uh, it gets better. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're talking about ethical problems with the mitochondrial transfer. Uh, obviously, using enzymes that edit DNA have their own set of ethical problems. If you read the New York Times, you saw that uh, maybe last week, that there's a lot of concern related to the nuclear DNA editing that uh, uh, these enzymes now can, can do, and it's relatively easy. So scientists are seeking you know, a ban of using these enzymes to modify human genes. Uh, one click, please. 
So what we're doing here is using it to eliminate mutant mitochondrial DNA that I would not consider that editing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we might have another meeting like this uh, soon. <laughs> All right, next. Okay, so what I think is that this might offer, as I said, an alternative. Uh, it's still not as advanced as uh, mitochondrial replacement therapy. We still don't know how efficient for each mutation we can uh, reduce those levels. But it would be, let's say, another option in, to the arsenal. This is the electron transport chain. Uh, we, we heard about how many genes you need. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA has 37 genes, but really, most of these genes are necessary to make 13 proteins that are part of this enzyme complex that have more than 100 proteins. Now, this is a machine that has to work to produce ATP. We can discuss if this machine can work a little better, a little worse. But I think what uh, Heather and Kira showed us is that when this machine is broken, uh, the consequences are pretty bad. So anything we can do, I believe, to, to make this machine work better <laughs> uh, is something that, uh, that, that we should do. And uh, we owe that, I think, to families. Next one. All right, I just want to touch on that. That's not really my, my topic, but that's something that uh, I always want to talk about in meetings like this. And maybe the next talk by Doug will go a little bit against this. But uh, one of the concerns is that there is a, a problem compatibility between the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA. Now, there have been several of these experiments, natural experiments, that suggest that this is not a big problem, at least for the health of individuals. Uh, this woman here moved from Chicago in the 1900s to Japan, married a Japanese man, had a daughter that married another Japanese man, that had a daughter that married another Japanese man, that had a daughter, <laughs> right? So by now, this woman has the mitochondrial DNA from the Caucasian lineage, and the nuclear DNA is particularly all Japanese. Now, there is no evidence that there is any health problem with uh, this woman or any of the hundreds of thousands of examples like that that occurred uh, you know, uh, over time. So I just want to put that there, that uh, if there is a problem of compatibility, it's probably very minor because there's no evidence in humans that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a disadvantage of having that. And I think I'm gonna stop here. I'm still on green, so I have plenty of time so we can discuss more. Uh, uh, terrific. So um, we, we have until five, right? So we're actually we're actually good. We're a good session. All right. So thank you all. Um, we have one more talk. Yeah. So um, I guess um, until his light turns yellow, is there any quick question for Carlos? Um, I, I guess I just have one that if you could answer. Has it ever been? T could it be potentially problematic? The initial response to the heteroplasmy shift therapy, the depletion. Yes. That's one of the, the main problems that we have to address. If, uh, if a patient has a very high levels of mutation and we start cleaving that very efficiently, let's say, there will be a decrease in total levels of mitochondrial DNA that might not be good. Uh, there are different ways to approach that. First, it might be an enzyme that's not as efficient, so it doesn't cleave it as fast. Uh, the other thing, the other possibility is that uh, cells can stand that if you're in a controlled environment and, you know, not exercising and, and if the rebound is, is fast enough. In culture, we see that the depletion of mitochondrial DNA is compensated in a matter of hours. In, by, by 24 hours or 48, we, we're back to normal levels of mitochondrial DNA. So in theory, if the mitochondrial DNA is not doing anything until five days, there might be a window where it would be tolerated? In theory, yeah. And it also depends probably how low it gets. But the mitochondrial DNA is replicating during right. that time. Okay. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Alta wants to ask a question too. Um, you may have said this, and I missed it. I apologize. But in how many species have you seen this? Uh, the the restriction enzyme and the talins. We we work mostly with cells in culture, from rodents and from humans, and uh, in vivo we did only in, in mice. Okay, terrific. So I, I guess we'll go on to Dr. Wallace, and then uh, we'll have a panel at the end.